This is a drought map of America. I live in this red blob in Texas here. Despite my drought conditions, I have managed to grow a food forest in both my front and backyard. Unlike most of my neighbor's yards, which are relatively lifeless. What might surprise you is that the thousands of gallons of water I used were all free and none of it came from a well or a water company. In this video, I'll show you how to build a system that turns a half-inch drizzle into a knee-deep drenching so that you can irrigate your yard and grow things without having to rely so heavily on wells or water bills. Several years ago, I committed to getting my house off-grid from a water standpoint. You might have seen that video already. My giant rainwater system connects to my plumbing and takes care of my indoor needs, but outdoor irrigation in this climate can easily require upwards of 5,000 gallons per month. It was impossible to meet this demand with a single rain tank. Then one day it occurred to me, all that water flowing down the gutter each time it rains? Where does it go? A lot of people assume that stormwater winds up filtering into our aquifers or that it's used to supply cities with drinking water. Is that true though? To find out, I spoke to the people at our public works department. It turns out the water in my street winds up here. This is the Almost Park Dam, and a meager one half inch of rain in my part of town accumulates two feet of water at this dam wall. According to the people that manage San Antonio's stormwater, even just a half inch drizzle requires the flood water to bypass into a giant underground engineering marvel we call the San Antonio River Tunnel. This is basically a giant siphon that was built in the 1990s to bypass the majority of runoff water from the north side of town to the south side. Otherwise, the downtown portion of the San Antonio Riverwalk floods even in a modest rain event. After seeing this extremely impressive structure and talking with the incredible team of people that maintain it, two things were very clear. First, none of this water is used as a municipal water source. And second, when it rains in my part of town, anything more than a half inch of rain is intentionally ejected from our city. From there, it's sent down the San Antonio River to the Gulf of Mexico. So we are basically managing this water as a waste product. But what happens to the water on its way to the ocean? To find out, I reached out to the San Antonio River Authority. This is Sean Donovan, Manager of Environmental Sciences. He's been with the River Authority since 2012, and it's part of his job to ponder the same things I'm pondering in this video. A lot of people don't know that the San Antonio River is not just the river walk. It doesn't end where the, where the shops and the restaurants end. It continues for 240 miles downstream to the coast. So that water is going all the way downstream to the Guadalupe River and then eventually to San Antonio Bay. And as far as the water use, it, the San Antonio River does not have a lot of consumptive water uses south of town. The system that we have now is very heavily dependent on uh, what's called effluent uh, or discharge water from wastewater treatment facilities. Historically, the flow in the San Antonio River was spring-fed. Because of the consumptive uses of the aquifer water, those springs are usually dry. So without that effluent or that treated wastewater from uh, dischargers like saws or like the River Authority, there wouldn't be a river in times of drought. To your best estimation then, when we get a couple inches of rain here in town, is that a resource downstream or is it a risk for flooding downstream? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the, the San Antonio is, is just in the southeastern portion of an area called Flash Flood Alley. We get a little bit of rain and the river comes up really, really fast and it goes down really, really fast. So a rain like that could cause really big problems for some of our downstream communities because the way that our infrastructure is designed is to capture water run it off surfaces as quick as we can, put it into river systems or creek systems and move that water downstream. Obviously it helps protect life and property here in downtown San Antonio, but it could have um, you know, negative impacts to some downstream communities. Thank you very much for taking yeah. the time. Appreciate it. Absolutely, my pleasure. So apparently most days this river is almost all purified wastewater and any rain in our city just leads to swells in the river that are sometimes dangerous. But what about aquifer recharge? Does this water contribute to that? To find out, I reached out to San Antonio Water System, or SAWS. SAWS is the local municipality providing water for 2 million residents in the San Antonio area. Turns out the main source of our water is the Edwards Aquifer. Water is pumped out of the aquifer with giant pumps like these. This particular pump pulls 13 million gallons a day, and it's just one of many. The Edwards Aquifer is refilled by water flowing into the ground north of town. You can see here the green contributing zone that collects and flows water toward the recharge zone. The recharge zone is where land formations in soil allow for the water to actually infiltrate back into the aquifer. Since the bulk of the recharge zone is north of city limits, this means the water flowing down my street can't refill the aquifer. So in summary, when my neighbors water their yard, they open a spigot. Most of the water they use is coming from the Edwards aquifer. 
and when it rains, none of the water flowing down my street can recharge the aquifer. And that rain poses a risk to our city and people downstream. Hopefully by now you can see the case for using some of this rain as irrigation rather than sending it all to the ocean. But how? Our beloved little species has done an impressive job flatscaping our environment. While it's easier to build on flat ground, it does not allow for water to soak in. It may not sound that important, but let me demonstrate the effect that has on plants. This is Moundtown, and this is Pittsville. Both pots are identical and contain the same type of soil. The only real difference is the way the soil is shaped. Moundtown drains water away quickly. Pittsville holds the water and soaks it into the soil. Into each pot I planted the same type of seed. Then I watered each pot daily with 20 cc's of water. I ran this experiment for about 4 months. The soil shaped like a dome remained dry and the seeds never germinated. Pittsville on the other hand grew a lush little vine without much trouble. From this it seems pretty obvious that the shape of your yard has a real impact on water retention and plant growth. So I decided to change the shape of my yard. This can be done in different ways, but the general idea is to dig a ditch that flows from the high point of your property to a safe exit at the low point. My property slopes downhill from the street to a drainage way behind my back fence. That means if I want to fill my yard with water, all I have to do is create an inlet at the street and gravity will pull the water all the way through down the slope. Another reason my yard is simple is that I don't have a neighbor at the low point of my property. Any excess water that flows out of my yard does not pose a flood risk to anyone. If you do have a neighbor at the low point of your property and you copy this, you will flood them. <coughs> Not cool. So please engage with a landscaping expert if you have any doubts whatsoever on how water might flow through your property. With that disclaimer in mind, I'll show you two versions of this system. The first and simpler version only works for people whose yard slopes like mine. To start off, I dug a ditch through here. You can barely see it now, but that's because it works so well. On the right is how it looked the day I made it. Notice how much bigger the plants are just three years later. The key to an irrigation ditch is to add soaking pits along the path. Some of these pits are as big as 50 gallons or so. This ditch runs along the fence line because it was already a low point. Soaking pits near the fence line are also less likely to twist ankles. You should only slope the ditch about one inch every 20 feet or so. Remember the goal is to retain water so a shallow slope is better. Once you have a good ditch punctuated with soaking pits, you have to fill it with rainwater. For a downsloping yard like mine, this can be as simple as cutting the sidewalk and cementing in a 4 inch pipe. This pipe slopes downhill into my irrigation ditch and then gravity does all the work pulling the water downhill through my entire yard to ultimately spill out of the back of my property. Now let's build one that works for any yard with any slope. This next version takes water from the street, routes it into a sump on the other end of the sidewalk, and then pumps it uphill. From there you can have it flow back downhill and soak in anywhere you want. This makes for a much more versatile system that will work for almost any home out there. To start this job, I hired a contractor that is licensed with the city to demolish and rebuild sidewalks. It's the only part of the job I paid someone else to do, but rules are rules and I didn't want to break them. To ensure a flow rate sufficient to keep up with my sump pump, I chose 4 inch PVC pipes and I used two of them. I made sure my contractor understood these pipes need to slope downhill about 2 inches into my yard, and then I stayed out of his way as he embedded these pipes into the new sidewalk. Make sure the PVC pipes stick out a bit on either edge of the sidewalk. The ends pointing into my yard are duct taped shut to keep them from clogging with dirt. Eventually I put 4 inch flexible couplings on those ends. I used a multi-tool saw to trim down the street ends, so that if a car hits the curb it doesn't crack the PVC pipes. Then it was time to dig a trench that slopes downhill into my yard. Here you can see me attaching the flexible couplings to the sidewalk pipes. Then I added some 4 inch extension pipes. Ultimately, I added a 4 inch gate valve to each pipe so I could shut the pipes if necessary. You can see that every segment of pipe maintains a downhill slope toward the sump I'm about to build in my yard. I spent 3 years gathering footage for this video, and while I was forming it, it was forming me. It changed the way I see our constructed environment. Now every gutter and drainage way looks a bit like a leaky faucet to me. I can't unsee it. Just because the practice is common does not guarantee it is logical. 
Any region or culture concerned with drought would benefit from really analyzing how we handle our rain from a first principles perspective. If this message speaks to you, please help me share it. Literally, please take the time to share this video with anyone you know that might find it interesting or anyone that loves their lawn. I do my best to make quality content with a helpful message rather than making frequent topical videos. And for me to continue prioritizing the message, I need your help sharing it. And if you really want to help, a click of the thumbs up and subscribe button are always appreciated. Rather than limit myself to the narrow dimensions of a 55 gallon drum, I decided to make my own sump wall out of this steel. It didn't need a floor and I wanted a removable roof. This sheet of steel probably cost me about 10 bucks. I rolled this sheet into a giant tube. I chose a diameter big enough to easily fit the PVC sidewalk pipes through the side wall, but also small enough to add a lid that you'll see later on. This big notch I'm about to cut is to allow the pipes to pass into the center of the sump. With the sump wall in place, it was time to backfill the pipe trench. This is a Harbor Freight sump pump that can move about a gallon and a half per second. It's important to use a large pipe that allows for unrestricted flow. This is 2 inch PVC pipe. Then I hooked everything up just to make sure it can pump water. Let me explain how it all works. The rain comes from the street there, goes underground in the two big 4 inch PVC pipes. I got two gate valves here so I can close them if I want to. I'm holding them open with a magnet to a paracord so that they don't sag shut. This is a filter cage that I made for a previous project. And down there is a sump pump with a float switch. As the rainwater comes in and fills this, it raises up that float switch that activates the sump pump and the water comes spewing out into the canal here that then feeds the entire garden. But for a number of reasons, it would be much nicer if I could have all these components down lower than the top of this kind of custom barrel that I made. That way I can put something like a tabletop across the top here. So I'm gonna trim down the filter cage here and I'm gonna cut this pipe shorter so that the pipe passes through the side wall of the barrel and then I'll put something on top here. This filter cage is intended to keep leaves and sticks out of the sump pump. I'm using it mostly because I already had it. Something as simple as hardware cloth rolled into a tube shape would probably work just fine too. This is an extra large PVC pipe cutter. It makes slightly crooked cuts, but it's a huge time saver. Link in description. Here I'm using an oil dripper that's also in the description to feed cutting oil right onto the teeth of my hole saw. When in doubt, I use fast drying PVC glue. Patience isn't my strongest virtue. I left this PVC coupler unglued and held it in place with a screw so that I can technically take the system apart if I need to. I used 2 inch aluminum cam lock fittings to make this quickly accessible to hook up a huge 2 inch hose I'll show later on. Then I glued a long sweep elbow in place to make sure the water is directed down into my irrigation ditch. I drilled a hole in the back of the sump wall to pass the power cord through. This is a grommet to keep the cord from getting cut from pump vibrations. This is an old electric spool. It gives the sump a real frat house chic look. Then it was time to catch some rain. You can see here the brisk flow coming out of the pump, but notice the relatively minor flow entering the PVC pipes. 
that looked a bit suspicious that something wasn't working correctly. Here was the culprit. It turns out the dirt wall had eroded after several hours of rain and my irrigation canal was flooding back down into the sump. With the use of a trusty shovel, I dug more mud out of the soaking pit and reinforced the dirt wall around the steel sump. It has worked ever since without any trouble. Now all the water flows downhill through the irrigation canal to flood my front yard just like I intended. I've had friends express concern about breeding mosquitoes due to standing water. That has not been a problem whatsoever. Even a 50 gallon soaking pit is fully absorbed into the ground within a few hours. This doesn't give mosquitoes nearly enough time to develop. An added bonus is that the water that soaks into my yard is stored there and used by my plants during the dry months. Xeriscaping is a smart way to not consume water. This is a way to literally save water in the soil. To use this system in super light drizzles, you can add a sandbag to direct a slight flow of water under the sidewalk. Eventually, this accumulates enough water in the sump to turn the pump on and dump the water into your yard. And to those wondering how to do this without a canal right next to the street, this is how. With this system, you can hook up a flexible PVC hose using camlock fittings. Then it's just a matter of putting the other end of the hose wherever you want the water. They make a fitting to attach a garden hose, but the small diameter destroys the flow rate, so it's not practical. With the big hose in place, the world becomes your water park. Please use responsibly, but enjoy yourself. And that is how to turn a drizzle into a drenching in a desert. I'm growing all sorts of plants that my neighbors still insist won't grow here. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to share it with at least one other person you think would appreciate it. That little click can make the difference between a movie and a movement. I'd also be honored if you subscribed and hit the thumbs up, but that's a detail in comparison to sharing. That's going to do it for this round. I'll see you on the next one.